we secretly try to do is simply um, exalt what the silent cinema did in terms of even German expressionism. Everything was done inside the camera, 32 passes if need be, and we were trying to maintain the, um, well, for ourselves at least, the belief that we're, we're trying to you know, do that. I mean, I, we also don't, we haven't entered into that, uh, the kingdom of uh, CGI, computer generated images, because I think the way that we approach the work is very much, you, you work with your hands, you work with objects, and it's uh, all that touching of, of the puppet that's really, it's part of that uh, communion with the, uh, the object. The object that's really crucial that you, you don't want to lose that, that uh, hands-on experience. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. is one that I think is a very humble one and, and you approach the object, each one individually, whether, whether it's an object, whatever it might be as an object, whether it's dust or an invisible breeze or whether you're, you're dealing with a puppet, you're trying to explore the, both invisible worlds as well as visible worlds and then trying to make those um, Conjugate them. Into yeah, exactly. So, um, a great deal of the, the work in the studio, it, it, it becomes a sort of laboratory where you're, you have a very strong hunches, but a lot of the time you're, you're, you, you cannot know exactly what's going to happen. You don't know how, for instance, a, a screw might react to a movement, you know, and then you have to adapt all the time. So it's a process of a great process of discovery, very important one to, to the work. And I think that's why you, that we've really never, you know, worked with storyboards because we sort of realized they're useless. Um, so there's no storyboards in the show. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but for instance, kind of abusing or using the, the film you just saw as an example, how, what does trigger or what is the what can be the, uh, not storyboard, but the nucleus or the seed of a film. For instance, in that film, yeah. what, what, what triggered it? Was it... Uh, well, it was, a well, it was, the, it was yeah. the, the, the case of the, the yeah. yeah. It was the, we, we'd read, um, whilst researching for Institute Benjamenta, um, we wanted to invest, uh, invest um, some of our energy into discovering the, the nature of why deer antlers de root. And we know that, I mean, through certain museums, you can see these fantastic flowering. Well, well, if they're perfect, then it's a trophy, and then, you know, they're worth a lot of money. But the, the ones that are really worth a lot more money are the ones that are diseased and they, they de root. And we read in a, uh, a book, on, a Scottish book on deer, because we figured they know more about deer than, than people in London. And they, <laughs> they, 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 there was a footnote that said, well, when the hunter sh aims the rifle and shoots the deer at the sound of the, um, the right gunfire, sure. the deer turns and runs, but the bullet goes into one of the testicles. And at that point, the, very slowly, of course the deer doesn't die, very slowly the, the, the antler starts to de root. And that, well, there's the connection between the, that, this is a bit academic. Well, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I think no, also, also, I mean, there's a lot of children. Kids are really like this. <laughs> no, I think <laughs> testicle no, symmetry is that, a topic for Sunday mornings. <laughs> but it's true that, that when you, and that in the derooting of the, uh, the, uh, the antler, we then took an antler and sold it in half. And of course, it smells of semen. And so there is a direct connection between this is just, was a little discovery. Try this at home. <laughs> uh, but let's move on to um, the 
first film in the selection, which is also a kind of a dark tale film with a lot of fog at least, and it's a fairy tale in a way. And it's my first question should have been: Does everybody in the audience understand Russian? <laughs> no. По вечерам ежик ходил к медвежонку считать звезды. Они усаживались на бревнышки и прихлебывая чай смотрели на звездные. Она висела над крышей прямо за печной трубой. Справа от трубы были звезды медвежонка, а слева ежика. It is a revelation, it's, it's sublime in its simplicity and beauty, but I, I think one further reading about Norstein was that was his use of what's called the multiplane technique, which is layers of glass that, I, I know this sounds a bit technical, but I think it's part of the magic. The magic, yes, because we all, we all sort of know that Walt Disney created the multiplane, or he didn't, but he, he sort of he maximized, it. maximized it, and, and, and you see how badly he used it. He didn't do it well at all. Um, and Norstein used these, every, every layer of glass is, is, a, is a beautiful universe in itself, and, and, but also quite separate. It's the, it's the fact that the camera brings them all together. So, um, with my partner Natasha, we went, we went to visit uh, Norstein in, in Moscow once. And um, when, we, when I was finally given the chance to see the multiplane, I had no idea what really to expect, but there was just this room with this massive uh, um, object of, of these layers of glass and Yuri had to climb a ladder to, to look through the, the eyepiece of the, of the camera. So I imagined, as I told Timothy when I came back, saying the labor of just the amount of times he had to ca climb up a ladder just to look and to make a slight adjustment is uh, it's and, sure. And, and no video playback. No video, yes, exactly. We're, we're sort of all used to video playback and knowing exactly what we get, but. Even when we started out at the beginning, we didn't have, we couldn't afford video f playback. And uh, but what I think is that an animator works by radar. They they know deep inside themselves what the what the movement is and how it feels. My brother and I tried to, with Natasha, we tried to strong arming one one night, trying to get him to rework his his the the last film that he left unfinished, which is the the Overcoat by Gogol. He did 30 minutes and then the money ran out and I think his fortunes have fell badly that he's never had the further financing and now it's like 20 years later and I know the heart's gone out of the man but he, like he said his cameraman died and then his the composer who did this music died also and he said and we were trying there trying thinking we're being really naive but intelligent saying you've got to put music and sound on, on even if it's a torso, this film, you must secure it. And he just said, well, I, don't, I don't have a musician any longer. So he didn't trust anybody, I don't think. So, well, I think, don't think he ever had a producer or somebody yeah, who just no, uh, no. lobbied for him. So it's sort of lost. But let's discover yeah. Mr. Prokuk and see you in 10 minutes.
I want to talk a bit about uh, puppets. These puppets, a lot of simplicity, but gets the maximum of expression out of it. What is it about this this whole realm of, of Prague that that feeds you? Again, it was the animation festivals, but then having books, looking at um, history books on the, the 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 realm of the marionette in history, and you always saw that, that it was. The Eastern Europeans seem to have the most fascinating, darker imagery, and and I think and when we started to see more of their animation films, and particularly films from the 60s and 50s and 60s, that you felt that they that they had developed a very metaphoric language because they had to work in code, as it were, under the, the censorship in uh, Eastern Europe. So for us, it actually. You realize that 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 whereas in, in the West you just sort of lay it out um, that the, the Czechs, the Poles, the Russians were using such a fine, hidden, secretive language to actually get their message through at a, at a secondary level, which impressed us. You, your next film is also Polish, as Jan Lenica, uh, made by Polish, uh, Rinoceros piece of uh, UNESCO. Lenica is um, kind of probably an example of somebody starring in graphic design posters. He made posters for Polanski, I mean for a whole wealth of, of filmmakers, moving into um, time. We met Lenica a number of times in, in London and uh, in a way you could see that it, it had all sort of come to a close. Uh, he was teaching in Berlin and basically was um, Graphic design. film, and I, he, he, I think he had an unfinished project. An unfinished yeah. project, yeah. which we we saw one of the actors. Was it, it a feature film it? project? It was sort of live action, but um, this this particular film was. Uh, I don't think we actually saw this one. We we know Labyrinth and A, which is a. upstairs playing in the gallery yeah. in the gallery, but this one has always eluded us. So it's so dark charity. Yeah. Well, uh, um, well, let's watch it. here as, as animators, uh, but you come from, from graphic design, you're still in there, and you have actually a whole range of, of, of media and, and, and platforms you work on. Like, Where, yeah. At How one did point we were, we were asked to do a, an opera uh, by a, <clears throat> an English director who, who very much appreciated the animation films, and we, he came by and we talked and we said, there's no way we can do an opera. We're not sure even how to how to um, to imagine ourselves doing an opera. And he said, "Listen, you just do the sets, the decors, and I'll handle all the action." And he basically asked for two-dimensional sets, it, much like the um, Norstein multiplane. So we did what anybody who knows anything about theater you work in with flats going back in perspective. And so, in a way, it was a nice release, and we worked with him. Few other times we actually did one here at the um, the, Mazepa. the opera, the Mazepa, Mazepa yeah. in the Tchaikovsky uh, here at, back in '92. Working on on operas that you're you're building the a decor, which is you have to work at one to twenty four scale or sometimes one to fifty, depending. It's your call, really. But so in a sense, it was exactly working the same scale we tend to work in. So that wasn't a big leap. That was actually reassuring. But I think that. Well, Film gives you the chance to to use camera angles, to use lenses, and, and to, to develop a lot of the richness of, of, of a mise en scène, which theater is much more uh, focused in the sense that they don't have that largesse to say, 
you know, you, you, you basically, the opera might be in three acts, so it's basically three scenes, so it means you have to be highly focused on, on the imagery that you use, and in that sense, it's always been very instructive to, to, to think, try to think more theatrically, because you, you think with less, uh, more, more economy. In more, fact. yeah, exactly. But, and it also, uh, pushed you or triggered you to make work. Uh, I mean, you said at the beginning you were doing just the sets, not the not the action, not the choreography or the mise en scène of the actors or singers. But you did start to get involved with that as well. The integration of dance uh, within an opera, and then also seeing a chorus of 80 people invade your stage, sort of got us thinking about that um, that live action didn't have to be so intimidating and, and I think it was very much working on that opera that we sort of got the courage to start thinking about our first feature film, Benimento, and, and integrating choreography as a part of the movement and, 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 and a way to express in a much more visual way the movement. After the, the live action, did that change something with your, the way you manipulate the, uh, the puppets and the materials? I, I know we have a horror of making puppets walk, <laughs> so I think that's probably why we end up doing ballet films, in a way, to, to capturing feet. a kind of <laughs> movement, lifting off the ground, and in the case of what Kleist essay about the, the puppet and all that, never meant any, anything to us, frankly, at all. Well, the whole thing with the puppets is you have to screw their feet in, and I think that's what we were trying to escape, having to do. The gravity. Of it. Gravity, yeah. yes. So it's in a way, it's actually more of a challenge, challenge to make a hand fly through the air than to have a puppet walk across the stage. <laughs> shot it all out outdoors. Real sunlight. With real sunlight moving across in the background and also the scene in the in the in the shop. In the opening shop. shop. You can see trees reflected in the windows. Because the, the film stock wasn't sensitive enough to it wasn't fast in enough in those days to, yeah. so you needed a lot of light. And also you could see the wind blowing in the bedroom. <laughs> yeah. You've been collecting your own materials, your own working materials, but also your own footnotes, your own frame of references. Is that an active thing, or do you stumble upon things? Are you searching, or you're just finding? I think that you're, you're always actively searching, um, but you're also looking for those accidents that, that suddenly something crosses your path, and you either ignore it, or you, you, you round it up, and you, you... We may even just stick it on a shelf, but it's, nothing is meant to be logical. It's part of the, the rationale is to be illogical with... Um, and then to invest it with an, an archive, archive, archive of logic. Yeah. So you're being surprised by your own components or the things you. I think it's that feeling that when you go into a flea market, you have, you have no pre. You don't go there saying I'm, I'm looking for. Sometimes you do. I'm not looking for this or that, but you you want to be just surprised. And and oftentimes it's, you go into. The, the market, you see that the, the man or the woman whose stall you're standing in front of may have conjugated two objects, which is, we both look at each other and, and sort of wink and say, look at that. And they probably did it unconsciously, but it's already... Kind of surrealist meeting. Yeah, it's, true, it's a chance encounter of objects, and immediately you, you buy both. 
<laughs> Just a clever salesman. <laughs> exactly. They say, here come the quays. <laughs>